can start as soon as you see the music happen. Hi, a very good morning and a warm welcome. Uh, extremely pleased and glad to be here. Uh, personally, uh, glad to be back in office at least. You know, so so you know, feeling much better. I would say from a normal day. Uh, welcome, Mr. Tarun and Mr. Ram. Uh, I have very two eminent uh, you know speaker and friend from the industry to talk on a on a you know fiery topic on a fireside chat. I think it's not unknown to us that COVID-19 pandemic, you know, caused a major disruption in one area of business that was supply chain. The impact was such highly disrupted that, you know, we all became first time seen. Uh, what is the what is the impact or the degree of impact in an interconnected world of supply chain? There have been numerous disruptions across the upstream as well as downstream. It's starting from import issues, supplier going out of stock, you know, inaccurate demand forecasting. Uh, FG stock out, inventory piling up, you know, unavailability of transporters because of you know various other reasons, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So while you know the first part of pandemic last year landed up, you know, or or we all landed up in a world of surprise. I think you know we all know that in last few months uh, we were caught a bit underprepared. I would say, and in some of the sectors we really felt the pinch of it. Uh, so, so I believe that this is an apt topic to, you know, have a fiery chat on, uh, because uh, you know the way businesses are transforming today, the way we are becoming more and more digital. If we do not fix in any of our business the supply chain part of it, you know, you will you will land up having three big problems. One, your customer engagement will have an issue. Second, your brand, you know, will have a big impact because you will not be able to fulfill demands. And third, you know, your forecast of business leading into pricing all will have a ripple effect on the business. So on, on that context, you know, next 15 to 20 minutes, it will be great to hear from two people who have dirtied their hands much more than me in this area. And, you know, especially I would say that they have steered their own organizations in the last 15 months through such crisis. So welcome, Mr. Tarun, and welcome, Mr. Swaminathan, uh, you know, uh, to have this conversation with all of us. In fact, the question is to both of you and any one of you can get started, that how are you viewing this from general preparedness now going forward? Because, you know, something like this is probably there to stay with us, you know, once we hear of one strain going away or getting interested, we keep hearing about a new strain. Today, we keep hearing about something called a Delta, Delta Plus. So, you know, we will not be out of this event for some time. And business has to come back to normal. Business has to scale. Consumerism, we hope with the indications we are seeing, will slowly go up. And hence, the businesses for tomorrow needs to be much more better prepared. So, you know, if Mr. Tarun, you can go, go first, maybe, you know, uh, to give us a bit of a perspective of, because you are in in a in a industry uh, which is extremely heavily supply chain intensive, and you know you were all caught for surprise, to steering the organization you know through tough times and now being ready for the new world. So over to you to hear from you your perspective. Uh, thank you, Mr. Goswami, for uh, uh, having me here. Uh, Economic Times and. Uh, you know, I'm very happy to share my perspectives on this. And uh, I think, uh, first of all, Zydus Wellness has a set of products which are very essential in nature, food products and nutrition products like uh, Complan, Sugar-Free, Glucon D, uh, Neutralite, and also some personal care products like Heavy Youth and Myself. So uh, we were at a point in time where we had to supply some of these products which are very essential in nature for consumers uh, in lockdown era, or even when they are recovering, uh, glucon D becomes very, very relevant. And some of these products had to be, uh, you know, made available. I think what pandemic has uh, really taught us is, uh, uh, is that people are central to everything we do. And, uh, you know, sometimes uh, while we know the importance of people, but employee centricity has taken a very different meaning altogether. Employee, and actually it's not employee centricity, people centricity. Because it's not just our employees. We have a few hundreds of employees. But there are thousands and thousands of people who are fully dedicated to us who work 
uh, for us uh, through various partners that we have, whether it at the front end through a distributor where there are salesmen who are working dedicated to us, whether it's our CNS uh, where there are people dedicated to us. There is 25,000 farmers who supply milk uh, to our uh, you know, plant every day for which we make compliance. So, and, you know, casual workers, whole lot of, so it's, it's we're talking about the whole ecosystem uh, which has to be uh, taken care of. And any problems at any part of the entire value chain uh, could affect uh, what we are out to do, uh, being able to provide uh, the crucial uh, essential products uh, to our consumers. So, so therefore, uh, uh, we didn't think only from our immediate employee perspective, but we thought from the whole uh, value chain where people in our supply chains, uh, upstream, downstream, we had to think about all of these people. And some of these work for MSMEs who are not able to provide all the supports like we as a company as Addis Wellness can. So, so we had to think about uh, uh, providing them resources, whether it was uh, medical help, uh, medicines, uh, financial supports. Uh, we went out and uh, provided financial commitments and insurance to people who are working for our distributors or for our CNFs, uh, providing some other supports that could be made possible for our um, you know, other uh, partners that who are much smaller and needed help to keep them up and running. <clears throat> the last piece that, that we've really focused ourselves uh, is, uh, you know, this is the time when uh, we have we've really re-looked at uh, keeping our business alive through re-looking at our SOPs or drafting the right SOPs so that, you know, the possibilities uh, of... Uh, uh, mishaps reduce. Mishaps are talking about uh, where some we have to shut down a plant because there is a high level of infection. We did go through that situation last year. So we are ensuring that we, we have the right uh, COVID appropriate behavior right through the value chain. Uh, SOPs are put in plants. Uh, the uh, entire piece is thought through end to end and uh, we are able to ensure we are training and uh, uh, providing vaccination to our uh, people. So I think that's really where we focused most of our attention on. Because some of these things we learned last year and now we're preparing for the future. And if we put all the SOPs, the right, uh, you know, infrastructure in place, we'll be better prepared for the future. Uh, Thanks, Mr. Tarun. So coming to, you know, Ram to yourself, you're in an industry which is like an enabler to this whole supply chain, you know, and, and the enablement is dependent also on various, you know, factors, you know, transportation, people, people doing different roles. How did you come out of this crisis? Because, you know, if logistics fail, even if we have the best of goods or services, you know, probably, you know, making it reach the last mile to the consumer is a problem. And that is what you are faced with. So with all the moving parts, how did you plan? How did you steer yourself out of this stop? So uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Omek, and uh, and I think Tarun said a bunch of things which I think we've done as well. So I will kind of not repeat that. Uh, uh, but I think from a from a from an overall perspective, obviously, you know, we believe the way supply chains are fundamentally designed will go through a transformation. Um, but historically, supply chains in our in our country and across businesses have really been designed to provide. Uh, you know the uh, the products at with the you know at the at minimum cost with the shortest lead time, um, and and there's been a huge focus on cost to serve, and and clearly the pandemic has changed the paradigm in, in some measure, if not in great measure. Uh, for us as a company, I think we really try to we try to focus on three four things. First one is uh, you know, we stress tested all our supply chains. All of the supply chains operations we have obviously are for uh, for for our customers and did a lot of work on actually just test testing all our supply chains, uh, you know, doing multiple scenarios with our customers uh, and being kind of prepared for that. Uh, I think that's going to be a continuing factor as we look to forward to a lot of volatility you know, over the next 12 to 18 months. Uh, the second thing which we really try to do is drive a lot more integration across service lines. Uh, you know, what we found is that uh, you know, supply chains inherently historically have been interdependent, but not integrated. Right and and go to markets for many of our customers have become very blurred, uh, right? And therefore, uh, integrating across service lines between transportation, warehousing, between the first mile um, and driving uh, you know, alignment across mm -hmm. this has been really important. 
the third one has been investing in, in technology really to enable the first two, right? Uh, which I think has been really critical. And the last one, and I will just echo this though, Tarun already covered this, was it has really been a huge investment on the human element. You know, at some stage, no matter how much you invest in technology, all your models go out of the window. Right? And the hand of the steering wheel actually becomes really important. So uh, in our business, uh, we've got thousands of employees who are picking products every day in warehouses, um, who are part of larger ecosystems. We have transporters, divers. And so bringing the human element back at the center of the way we address this uh, has been very, very critical. And I think those have uh, those did allow us, uh, you know, the focus on timing integration solutions, uh, you know, the, our discipline around workflows, workforce shop floors, reentering processes, I think allowed us to come back pretty well in the second to fourth quarter. And I think overall preparedness, I would say, is actually better, uh, is fairly good. Uh, you know, kind of like the earlier wave, uh, global trade flows are, are fairly more, are better, better than last year. Uh, goods are moving across countries, though, though transportation has become more expensive from a cross-border perspective. Um, you know, and, and supply chains have responded. I think where demand has not been a problem, uh, I think supply chains have responded like cables or durables or electronics as lockdowns have eased. Um, uh, I think volume, uh, fulfilling volumes has been, uh, has been something which the industry and service providers like us uh, I think have been able to get back on uh, in fairly quickly. Thanks, thanks, Ram. You know, uh, that, that was a great perspective of, you know, how to integrate across service lines, really like that point of your. And Tarun, you know, uh, uh, you spoke about what all you did. You know, primarily, always planning used to be for uncertainty. But I think last 15 months, it has been planning in uncertainty. So planning in uncertainty is always very difficult. So do, do you think the whole approach to supply chain planning has got challenged the way traditionally we used to all plan? How is that going to evolve? You know, any perspective on that? Sure, uh, Shamik. I, I think uh, when we when we acquired uh, Kraft Heinz business and uh, you know, and we were integrating the whole thing, uh, we were uh, understanding that we need to prepare ourselves for a different level of uh, future readiness. Uh, we were preparing ourselves for a very different, uh, more digital way. But uh, I think. Uh, uh, I think this whole uh, fundamentals of uh, planning and the approach to planning has got uh, uh, challenged in the way last one and a half years has been. And in, and the level of agility that benchmarks we would have thought two years back, four years back, no more hold true. And therefore, uh, I think planning is undergoing a dramatic shift. And uh, so before I talk about planning, I think we are, we've actually now gone, gone back and uh, re-looking at our manufacturing footprints itself in terms of uh, business continuity. Uh, we, we were looking at deeper one place, uh, larger plants for each of our products. Now we are looking at how do we ensure that we have multiple locations where we have sufficient capability and capacity to you know, move. I think uh, last year when one of our plants was uh, down for three weeks, uh, we did move very quickly to work with some third-party partners who we already have existing relationships with. But we've actually already started re-looking at our manufacturing footprint to have a business continuity built in. Now, <clears throat> when we look at our normal planning, and um, that was a more long, large, uh, long-term planning, but also planning uh, in uh, short and medium term. I think uh, the agility that we need to do and the way uh, we need to do has is changing. Earlier, we would typically work with one plus three month plans and certain. I think uh, it's not just reviewing last last year that we were doing on a weekly and uh, at a certain levels. I think now we are looking at how we can respond or prepare ourselves uh, for even a demand sensing and response times at a much shorter times, a um, far more nimble uh, environment. So as we are implementing our digital uh, planning tools. Uh, with uh, some of the big guys, the, uh, the question I have had and we we're discussing is that how do we, you know, you not worry only from a COVID perspective, but also start looking at creating a far more nimble environment and start responding to those 
because disruption, this is one big disruption. There are a uh, certain amount of disruptions we'll always have to get used to. And also, uh, you know, prepare ourselves for a very different uh, ways of working. So we are looking at re-looking at cycles, which used to be much longer, four weeks, uh, 90 days kind of uh, cycles uh, being crunched to a weekly, uh, you know, uh, both demand sensing as well as uh, fulfillment uh, cycles and uh, a far uh, more agile way of uh, responding to those situations as we speak. Thanks, thanks, Tarun. So taking a cue from that, uh, Ram, if I come back to you, uh, as a service provider to somebody like, say, you know, Zydus or Zydus of the world, are you seeing the business model of engagement also evolving and changing? The demand, the way you would look at, you know, from a service provider angle, uh, you know, the whole engagement with your buyer, is that also getting challenged? Is that also evolving? Absolutely. I think, uh, as Somik, I think as Tarun just mentioned, if I can look at it differently, I think the way we consume and the way we make and sell is going to go through a fundamental shift. Um, and, and given those two factors, I think the way supply chains are dissolved, evolved, uh, will also change. Uh, and the way we partner with customers will also actually evolve very differently, right? And so, uh, and that's um, clearly something which uh, which one can visibly see uh, as we partner with our customers. Uh, you know, uh, the, the, there's a big shift, I think, from cost to serve. You know, traditionally, when we walk with our customers, customers really talk about you know, the big variable you really had as a fixed thing was your volume. And you try to manage outcomes given fixed, you know, kind of driving up predictability in volumes. Uh, I think now the move really is towards saying move from cost to serve to cost to win. You know, minimize my cost to win business as opposed to minimize my cost to serve business, right? Um, you, know, you know, see how you can actually manage across different elements uh, to drive more agility. And so the engagement, I think, has become far more strategic right? Uh, because it's no longer just at a physical process layer, but you have to bring both agility in, you know, in redesigning processes, but also in the way you manage and share information uh, with your customers to support their decision-making models. Um, and, and I think, uh, and I think many of us have made that change. For example, last year, I think as we came out of way one, you know, we sensed very closely with many of our customers that there will be a big pent up demand, uh, you know, uh, to supplies fulfillment have to be more regions. Uh, and we work very closely with them to build up uh, flex capacities, right? Uh, which would come on and shut down in four to five months, right? In fact, last year we bought in a million square feet of capacity and hired 10,000 people, uh, you know, just for four months. We brought on facilities, shut them down across different geographies based on how they sense demand and how they want to kind of regionalize fulfillment. So I think the nature of um, the nature is, uh, is going to become much more about how you can co create design. And how you can enable decision making as opposed to how can you just be a plain vanilla service provider, uh, right? Working towards a cost or delivery construct. And that's definitely a change just happening. Fantastic, fantastic points, you know, Ram, both from you and Tarun. I know we are we are running out of time. I wanted, you know, if you can both 30 seconds give a perspective on because there's a huge, huge focus around the whole net zero commitment. You know, the ESG play is becoming extremely, extremely important, both from a buyer and, and the service provider perspective. So quick snippets on that before we bring it to a close. Any one of you can go first. So I can go first, Tarun. Or yes, Tarun, sure. You, yeah, sure. sure. Yeah, so I, I'd say sustainability is very much bang and center of the conversation, Somek, right? Uh, but, but that said, I think uh, the, the challenge for us in the service industry is how do we drive sustainability in supply chains without asking for significant premiums for that, right? Uh, so, so, you know, the question is, how do I make sustainability par for the course and not an not an kind of additional offering? And this is where I think the larger challenges, uh, logistics are a very important area, I think, for, you know, for, for industry as a whole to drive sustainability in. Um, and, and where we've been able to drive uh, that without significant premiums, I think we've seen a huge amount of benefit, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, driving solar energy in our warehouses and facilities. Uh, you know, we launched an electric vehicle last mile delivery service last year called EDEL, which is now 
uh, pan India across you know, eight cities. Um, and we've been able to, and in those service lines, we've actually delivered cost per package is actually lower than ice space vehicles in many cases, right? Um, and, and, and when we are able to deliver that proposition, I think uh, there's a huge amount of potential demand for it and huge amount of adoption. So, so my only, I guess my summary is, I think sustainability is very critical, but I think it's imperative that uh, that both industry and service providers like us both have to drive that migration, right? Thanks, uh, and thanks, in the long Ram. run, one cannot expect a price premium for being sustainable. Thanks, Ram. Uh, uh, you know, Tarun, a quick snippet from you. Yeah, yeah, I'll try to be quick, but I have a couple of points to talk about. First of all, I think uh, what this pandemic and what the current environment has shown is that, uh, you know, risk management and business continuity has taken a completely different meaning. And I think uh, like <coughs> Mr. Swam Swaminathan talked about, it's no more just about cost to serve, but a lot more and cost to win. But having said that, I think uh, the sustainability and social and, you know, the whole uh, ESG piece, is becoming very central and it is not just less led by uh, uh, the current COVID situation, but I think uh, the more and more realization in the, uh, for everyone that this is the right way to do business. And my learning in this is, uh, you, you can look at any of the global examples. ESG is becoming uh, almost imperative and uh, a crucial learning which I want to share was that they are not at conflict in terms of our cost uh, uh, focus also. Uh, several of our sustainability initiatives, we've seen that we've been able to do it, uh, helping us also reduce costs of doing business. Because we have to look at a total cost of doing business and it, not just at a one element. And several times we've been able to, uh, uh, you know, be successful in managing both the what normally appear as contradictions. So uh, clearly, I think this is the way uh, future will uh, evolve for all of us. We may need to find solutions ahead, but... Uh, this is uh, going to be imperative and uh, quite embedded in the way we do business as we move forward. Thanks, thanks. It was amazing, you know, getting some of these, you know, absolute nuggets of the business nuances from two people who have dotted their hands on this. Uh, before I hand it over to the host, uh, I think two, three big takeaways, uh, which, which Ram and Tarul spoke about. The world will move towards more about co-creating products and services working together between the service provider and the service buyer. Second, technology will become an imperative part of making the last mile happen. Care of the ecosystem becomes absolute imperative importance and ESG will be part of the course and it is not going to be just a value add to be provided. So it will be part of an integral business plan as we move forward. With that, uh, I would like to draw curtains to this discussion. Uh, enjoy thoroughly being with you all. Over to you, host. Thank you. Thank you, Shomek. Thank you, Tarun. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shamik. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you so much, uh, firstly, Shamik, for beautifully uh, spearheading that conversation for us all. And thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tarun and Mr. Ram Praveen for joining in. Uh, I believe we managed to actually gather some wonderful takeaways, all those takeaways that will be very integral towards driving business in the future. So thank you so much again for joining us this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Well, I must admit, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in fact, uh, from the session, we'll also be moving forward towards our next uh, uh, particular address, a special address uh, that's uh, around a topic, uh, which is to do with if the world will actually see real normalcy. So somewhere, I believe, that the speakers in the previous session have set the tone for the next. And why I'm saying that is also because, once again, we will be having Mr. Ram Praveen Swaminathan, Managing Director and CEO of Mahindra Logistics, uh, to probably share the, give us a little if I may say reality check, if the world will really see any kind of real normalcy. And I think I'm extremely eager to find out the answer to that question. And I think it will be interesting to see what Mr. Ram Praveen has to share. So stay with us and we'll get the next session started in just a couple of seconds.